Hello Dr. Humans, welcome back to Immunology The War Is Over and today's video where we will be diving into the immunological differences between a bone marrow transplant and a solid organ transplant. Okay, so just to be clear, underneath this cartoon character, I am a nephrologist and a medical educator. I am not a bone marrow transplant expert, but I did sit down with someone who does have expertise in this area so that I could bring this to y'all. Okay, so for both of these types of transplant, we need to understand the parts of the immune system which can get in the way of transplants at large. Things that are important for all transplants are HLA typing, donor specific antibodies and ABO compatibility. Now if you want to dive into these in detail there are some transplant resources over on our website where we cover cross matching and molecular typing and all the things but here I'm just going to give you the nuts and bolts of this so that we can broadly apply it to the various types of organ and bone marrow transplantation. Okay so HLA typing. On chromosome 6, we have HLA genes which code for our HLA molecules, which is basically an umbrella term for MHC1 and MHC2 molecules. MHC1 is coded for by HLA genes A, B and C, whereas the MHC2 molecules are coded for by HLA genes DR, DP and DQ. And you may remember that MHC1 is present on all nucleated cells in the body and interacts with cytotoxic T cells. Cells, and MHC2 is predominantly present on antigen presenting cells such as B cells, dendritic cells and macrophages and interacts with CD4 T cells or T helper cells. Now if you need a little reminder on T cells at large be sure to check out some of our earlier videos in this series, I'll leave a link to those below. So these little molecules were created by mother nature in order to present antigens to the immune system but they also act as markers of self. And so our HLA typing is important to any transplant we do, both solid organ and stem cell transplantation. So before we do the transplant, we will figure out the HLA typing of the donor versus the recipient. Another thing we do before any transplant is suss out the presence of donor-specific antibodies or DSAs. And if we find a, a DSA before the transplant happens, then we need to ascertain how strong that DSA is, so how much of it we think is around, and then we decide if the transplant is going to be viable or not based on the strength of the DSA. And some of the reasons we might have DSAs in the circulation is due to what we call sensitizing events, things like receiving blood products, having a previous transplant, or pregnancy. All of those things can lead to exposure to other people's HLA molecules and those DSAs being formed. And the last immunological aspect to consider is ABO compatibility. And this one is handled rather differently between solid organ and allogeneic stem cell transplantation. So we'll circle back to that in just a tick. Now what I want to do is to fill in this little table together to contrast the immunological considerations of solid organ transplant versus allogeneic stem cell transplantation. So let's start with solid organ transplants. That's way easier to comprehend in my opinion. So in a solid organ transplant, you are placing someone else's organ into another person with a fully established immune system. So of course the concern here is that the person's immune system is going to recognize the organ as foreign and reject it either with cell mediated immunity or antibody mediated immunity or both. So to minimize this risk we try to get the best HLA match possible. We want those little MHC molecules on the surface of the cells to sort of blend in if we can. But in reality, we're usually transplanting people with some HLA mismatches. And the more HLA mismatches you have, the higher the risk of rejection in the longer term. And of course, the less mismatches you have, the better the outcomes. So in reality, we get this close enough, but it's rarely perfect. But even more important than HLA typing 
is the presence of donor specific antibodies or DSAs. Now DSAs can form after the transplant is in situ and that can convey a risk of rejection in the longer term. But the ones we worry about most at the time of cross-matching is preformed antibody. These already exist in that person's circulation. And if the levels of the antibodies were high enough, they could wipe out this new organ in a process called hyperacute rejection. And so hyperacute rejection is basically when you have antibodies in your circulation, you connect the blood supply of the new transplanted organ those antibodies rush into the organ and stick to their little antigens and then draw in complement to annihilate that organ. And we know that complement is a noxious little part of the immune system and it will destroy that organ in an absolute jiffy. So that's the issue with preformed DSAs. We need to know about these ahead of time. And thankfully, with modern cross-matching techniques, we can detect these antibodies. And if we think that those antibodies are going to put this organ at significant risk, then we just won't go ahead with the transplant. And in a similar vein, another thing we worry about is ABO compatibility. Because guess what? Anti-A and anti-B antibodies are preformed antibodies, right? They can act like donor-specific antibodies. Now that's not intuitive because this organ that's coming in has been washed of any red cells, right? So it doesn't come with red cells attached to it. They've all been washed out. But solid organs have AB antigens on their endothelium, right? So the very lining of all the blood vessels in that organ is lined with AB antigens. And so Anti-A and anti-B behave like preformed donor-specific antibodies and ABO compatibility for solid organ transplants is incredibly important. So for the vast majority of solid organ transplants like hearts and lungs, we're going to have to have ABO compatible situations. The exception to the rule would be kidney transplants where we have a live donor and we can use plasma exchange and immunosuppression ahead of time to reduce the titers of those anti-A or anti-B antibodies and we can assess the situation and determine whether it's safe to go ahead with that transplant or not. So kidney transplants would be the exception to the rule. We're definitely doing ABO incompatible transplants in these patients but hearts and lungs rely on deceased donors and they're doing ABO compatible transplants every time. Okay, so that was solid organ immunology considerations in a nutshell. Now let's move on to bone marrow transplantation, which is more properly termed allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. Now, of course, there are two different types of stem cell transplant. There's allogeneic and there's autologous. So today I'm going to be talking about allogeneic because that's when you're putting, you know, someone else's stem cells into another person and that has these immunologically relevant aspects. But of course, there is another type of stem cell transplant called autologous stem cell transplant where that person's stem cells are taken from them, they're given chemotherapy to annihilate a condition and their stem cells are given back to them. So not talking about autologous today, this is allogeneic transplant only that I am discussing today. So with allogeneic stem cell transplantation, we have a situation where we are obliterating someone's immune system as it exists currently, their bone marrow cells, their B cells, their T cells, all the cells are being annihilated. We are wiping them out and we are starting again. We are going to infuse somebody else's immune system into this person. (laughs) So let's see how that plays out. So here we have a person with every cell in their body covered in MHC molecules. And now we have a new immune system, which may potentially recognize those molecules as foreign. So it's not so much that the person rejects the graft, it's more the graft rejects the person, right? Graft versus host disease can absolutely occur, and that is a concern. But the other handy thing about that is that if you do a stem cell transplant for leukemia, the leukemic cells have that MHC molecule that the person has, right? So if you put in the new immune system, 
and it very much dislikes the person's MHC molecules, then the new immune system can attack those pesky little leukemic cells that try to resurface. Okay, so you get this graft versus leukemia effect, which you can imagine is actually a bit of a superpower in this situation. So now coming back to look at those differences in immunological aspects, first of all, HLA typing. So HLA typing is important here because we really don't want the new immune system to go forth and cause severe graft versus host disease, right? That could kill someone. So we want to have the new immune system, the new bone marrow without the leukemia, but we want that person's rest of body to be pretty symbiotic with this situation. So the HLA matching is very important and ideally the more matches the better. Now they can do transplants where there are HLA mismatches, that is possible, but they'll make a decision on whether they think it's viable or not and that's all done by the cross-matching centre. So here in Australia that would be done by Red Cross and they'll determine if it's going to be viable or not based on those specific mismatches. Now what about DSAs and stem cell transplants? So the thing about antibodies in patients who are receiving a bone marrow transplant is that the antibodies they have remain in their circulation for a while after the transplant. So they'll have their antibodies in the circulation, the person has chemotherapy to annihilate their bone marrow before being infused with stem cells, but those antibodies in the circulation remain intact, right? Eventually, they will die off and fade as the plasma cells that created them die off and fade. But there will be some antibodies at the time of that stem cell transplant just kicking around in that person's circulation. So if you had a donor specific antibody to this new stem cell, that absolutely is relevant, right? That donor specific antibody, that DSA can come and attack those stem cells. So again, just like in solid organ, they will make a decision as to whether this transplant is going to be viable based on the DSAs that are detected before the transplant. So now finally, what about ABO compatibility as it applies to bone marrow transplant? Now this is fascinating and not at all intuitive. This is going to blow your mind. <laughs> so like I said, there are antibodies in the circulation at the time of the stem cell transplant. So if there's anti-A or anti-B antibodies, they're going to be in that person's circulation. But when we infuse the stem cells, we're not infusing red cells, right? We're infusing stem cells. So there's not a lot of red cells coming in here. And so there's nothing really for those anti-A or anti-B antibodies to attack. Now, eventually when this new bone marrow engrafts and is established, it will start to make its own red cells. And that will absolutely follow the ABO type of the donor of the stem cells. And so there could be some crossover between red cell production with the new bone marrow and these antibodies in the circulation. If that crossover happens, however, the hematologist can very much manage this with some steroids and some rituximab. So it is manageable and it's temporary. So solid organ transplantation, ABO incompatibility is of paramount importance because if we get that wrong, it can lead to hyperacute rejection right there on the table. Whereas with bone marrow transplantation, ABO incompatibility is ideal. They would still rather go ahead with an ABO compatible transplant. But if that's not possible, there are ways around it and they don't seem to fuss too much about it overall. So that was the immunological differences between solid organ transplantations and allogeneic stem cell transplantations. Thank you so much for joining me. And if you did like this video, be sure to like and subscribe. It would mean the mostest. And I hope you have a great week. Bye.